Okay, it's really nice to be with you this second time. I must tell you, though, that the real plan for today that we were going to do was we were actually originally going to talk about the Spanish Civil War in the, 19, the late 1930s. And Dr. Arnold Kramer, uh, a renowned history professor at Texas A&M, was going to give you the historical part of the war, and I was going to come back and talk about my uncle Arthur, who was one of the American volunteers in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who went in 1937 to help fight the fasc defeat the fascists um, in what turned out to be the pre-war to the Second World War. Unfortunately, Dr. Kramer passed away a few months ago. And uh, it's a great loss uh, to many of us who uh, knew him. My wife and I were driving back from Dallas on Sunday and there was a program that was speaking about uh, um, the Germans who uh, were brought to this country as prisoners uh, of war in the Second World War. And there was Dr. Kramer's voice on the radio um, as part of the interview. And um, unfortunately, I didn't make it through his talking without shedding a tear because he was a dear friend. But um, without Arnie, I did not feel comfortable to do the total background and historical part of this. But I um, have this other interest in Inuit art. And so I'm very privileged today to talk to you about the creation and evolution of Inuit prints. Um, I am going to, uh, let me start by just showing you an example of a print. Okay, great. So this is a print by a woman named Pitsy Olak, uh, who is, uh, happens to be the favorite artist of my wife and I. Um, it is partially printed from a stone cut, so think potato block print. So the part you're printing is the part that you haven't carved away on the stone, and then it is overlay uh, with stencil, which uh, creates the colors that are there. So it's a multiple um, printing process that would bring that about. I also brought, although that's not going to be the chief focus of our talk, a few examples of Inuit sculpture. So here is a Sculpture. This is from uh, the Cape Dorset community, where that print is from as well. It's a man on a uh, whale. And I'm not going to tell you the legend behind it, but there's a legend about the man who's kind of captured this uh, uh, whale and, and he is enjoying this uh, ride. I have two other... Um, sure. I, it's a very hard stone that it, at the moment is slipping my mind, but I'll think of it before. Um, it's, uh, there are quarries near the Cape Dorset community, so it is a local stone to them. This is quite different. This is from Greenland. It's also Inuit, because they're Inuit who have uh, spread as far as the Greenland. This is a whale's tooth. Okay? This is a whale's tooth. And it is carved, they're called tupalax. And these were created as shaman figures. So the idea was they would either bring on or ward off evil. I am told that they lose their magical powers over time. And if that wasn't true, there is no way in the world I would have this in our house because I would not know which it was. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll carry exactly. this one. Yeah. I'll let you do that okay. one. And the third item I want to share with you, this is a piece of whalebone. And if you look at it, this is the vertebra of a whale. Okay? The vertebra of a whale. It's carved on both sides. This is the first piece of Inuit art that I ever acquired. Um, it has a story behind it. My father decided in about 1970, which is coincident to when I moved to Canada, that he had seen Inuit art in um, galleries in Vancouver and then in Toronto during his travels. And he decided um, since his, we're just kind of rested in here. Okay. Since his um, business that he was in, he was good at it, but it was boring that he was uh, really wanted to go back to school. He got a master's degree from USC that enabled him to uh, really plan the 12 courses he wanted to take. And he did that in, in cultures of the world, philosophies of the world, religions of the world. And one day, literally, he decided he was gonna open an Inuit art gallery since there wasn't one in the Los Angeles area. This was a very audacious move on his part. Um, he had seen Inuit art twice in his life. He had a few pieces that he bought at galleries. The gallery was going to be in his home, um, much to the chagrin of my mother. It would take over the living room and the dining room. And he convinced her to be a partner. And then he called me and he said, I've made arrangements with Canadian Arctic producers in Ottawa, where I was living. And he said, they are looking forward to your visit next week when um, I have a letter of credit for $50,000 worth of Inuit art, and I'd like you to pick it out for me. I said, oh, great. Um, so that weekend, I hit up the three Inuit art galleries in Ottawa, uh, learned what I could, and luckily there was a woman named Mary Craig at this basically distributors. So all the Inuit communities were sending their sculptures to Canadian Arctic producers and then they were distributing to the galleries. So I went there and with her help, the first day we laid out about 400 pieces. Now you would think that would be a, my goodness, I must have stripped the place bare, but picture every wall, floor to ceiling, four sculptures deep, uh, racks down the middle. I mean, it was overwhelming. Anyway, we, we did that task. At the end of the second day, we cut it down. You know, we were calculating and figuring out how much of this could really go to my father and the like. And I was leaving for the day. And I looked in this little conference room and on the side there were four pieces. Um, this this uh, whalebone piece being one of them that, gee, I hadn't really seen anything like that. And I said, oh, and um, I'll, I'll, let's take those four as well. And she said, no, you can't really have them. There's a way all this works. And that is at the beginning, you get to choose from the main room. And as we get to know your father better, he will get access to better and better stuff. And these pieces are the four that the Governor General's Office of Canada, so the Governor General is the representative of the Queen in Canada. The Governor General's Office, the Queen is about to visit, and he came this morning, his representative, and he picked one of the five pieces to give to the Queen, and these are the ones he didn't pick. So I said, okay, all these were Queen worthy, right? Said, yes, I said, I want all four of them. And it 
I won't go through the rest of the, the full rest of the story, but the result of it was, no, we couldn't send it to my father, but because I had worked so hard over the two days, they were gonna let me buy one of the four pieces at wholesale. That's the piece. So that was the first piece of Inuit art I ever acquired, and I figured it was queen worthy, so what the heck. Um, quite, quite the deal. Okay. So what I need, ah, I got it. Okay, with that as introduction, let's start. So contemporary Inuit art is really a byproduct of outside influences on the Inuit. Now some of you are a little confused, Inuit, what's that? That's what the Inuit call themselves. Uh, we have referred to them as Eskimos, but they prefer Inuit, okay? And understanding Inuit art is really about understanding the forces that have created the art, and it is relatively new as an art form that's distributed to the world. There is no, the language of the Inuit is a Nuktatuk, there is no word for art in the language uh, itself, um, but they now readily accept the art because in the economic structure of uh, the North, art represents uh, perhaps 20% of the economy in terms of what they're producing and what is being consumed uh, on a worldwide basis the most recognizable form of Canadian art on a worldwide basis is Inuit art. It is when they hold exhibits of Canadian art around the world, the request is to acquire and set up an Inuit art exhibit. So the Inuit originally, uh, they came over the land bridge um, uh, 6,000 or so years ago. Um, they came over the land bridge into uh, Western uh, Canada and Western United States. Um, they lived on the sea coast and then the uh, tundra. They had a, hunted whales and seals and uh, caribou. They were expert hunters. Um, if you're going to survive by hunting, you have to be good at it. Um, and remember at this point, they're doing this with uh, spears and with uh, surrounding and trapping animals, not with guns early on. Um, they could take down a bowhead whale and a bowhead whale is huge. And a, if you then, um, cut up the blubber from a bonehead, from a bowhead whale. Um, the, you can both produce the oil that would be needed for heating and uh, cooking, and you obviously have the blubber, which is extremely high in protein, extremely high. Um, there were three basic migration periods, the pre-Dorset from about 2000 to 500 BC, the Dorset period, and then the Tool period, uh, which is the Inuit that we see today. And the Tool, actually, they were bigger, they were stronger than the Inuit that were there before, and there was quite a battle as they moved all the way across Canada and eventually uh, some of them as far as Greenland. But they are the ancestors of the Inuit that we see today. Um, the North is a beautiful, beautiful area. I've been there and I'm gonna discuss the travels a little bit with you a little bit later. Um, glaciers, um, uh, sea body um, places in the spring, uh, plants do uh, grow, but a tree is that high. There's no point in being bigger. You're not gonna survive the winter. And I lay on my stomach and took pictures of a couple of these, and then when you develop them, they look like a tree. Except 
They're that big. For centuries, the Inuit lived on the land in small groups. And unfortunately, a combination of disease and health issues, food supply, uh, the need for education, the need for income in an increasingly uh, westernized uh, society. Um, in the 1930s, the fur uh, trade collapsed. Uh, both because of decimation of the, uh, the fur-bearing animals, uh, foxes and the like. Um, uh, Westerners brought to the Arctic uh, diseases, same problem with Native Americans, brought these diseases that decimated populations. Tuberculosis was a uh, a devastating illness among many of the Inuit. At one time, uh, the largest Inuit community was in Hamilton, Ontario, with the 3,500 Inuit who had to be brought from the north for treatment in the tuberculosis centers there. Um, so the government began relocating Inuit who lived in small groups Whatever the size of the group that was determined by the number of people who could be supported by the animal life in a particular area. The group wasn't any bigger than that. Other people would have to move on to other areas. They were very dispersed uh, across the land. They moved uh, spring and winter uh, depending on where the animals uh, were that they would harvest but the government started moving them into uh, communities. And that changed an entire way of life. Uh, some of it was good in that every community, the government would have a nurse there. They would have access uh, to airstrips and planes that could get them to tuberculosis centers. There was a way uh, bring ships in with supplies and uh, food. But when you do a move like that, it, the threat is to the basic culture of the people. They knew how to hunt because they were patient. They could sit or lie for hours and wait for the seal to come up in the hole. Now you're living in a community where there's no ancestral history of how to live in this kind of fixed community uh, life. So now there are about 53 communities. Um, I'll show you a map in a minute. About 53 communities uh, comprising anywhere from 40 to 50,000 kind of Inuit. A number of Inuit have left these communities and they live in what they refer to as the South, which would be mainland uh, Canada. Um, many of them are uh, living there quite successfully, um, but it, obviously all of this resulted in a dramatic change in Inuit life. So it's a little bit hard to see, but um, this, this is Quebec. This is Ontario, so New York and all of that is down here. The main communities are what is now called Nunavut, is up in this area here. This would be coming down the coast of Newfoundland. Okay, this would be over to Newfoundland. And the major, excuse me, the major um, community that is uh, uh, most well known for the art is Cape Dorset, and it's right here. It's on ba what's uh, Baffin Island, okay? Uh, all of this is an island. Um, so that, that kind of gives you a, a little bit of a picture. The Inuit uh, were governed by the government of Canada and uh, benevolently uh, governed as best they could. But uh, uh, not too many years ago, the Inuit got control 
of their own land area. And they now have independent uh, territorial government. And the communities that are on this map are named Cape Dorset and Baker Lake and Holman Island and Resolute Bay and the like. They have all reverted to Inuit names, back to the original Inuit names, not the names, not the names that were given to them by outsiders and mainly uh, the church and uh, the government who had, who had control of the territory. So the birth of the modern Inuit art movement, um, in, Inuit had been decorating uh, tools, they've been decorating um, uh, amulets and masks and other items. They've been doing that for centuries. Everything was small, transportable, or disposable. And if you think about that, if you're moving from here to here by sled, you don't want a huge stone, 80-pound rock that you've carved that you now have to carry around on your sled. So it was small kinds of stuff. It was mainly for decorative kinds of purposes. When the explorers began to show up in the north and then the whalers, um, there was interest in trading for some of those amulets or some of those items. And in fact, there was dickering that went on and said, okay, well, we have this thing we call a cribbage board. Could you make a cribbage board perhaps out of a walrus tusk? And then, oh, gee, you have that decoration. When we come back next year, you know, we'd like to have eight of those. So Inuit uh, wanted the rifles, they wanted uh, uh, coffee, they wanted, unfortunately, alcohol. Uh, other things that the traders could, I mean, sorry, that the uh, whalers or the explorers could supply. And this began some idea of we could produce art objects that would have value in terms of what somebody else would give it to us for. Um, so after World War II, the Canadian government had what they called arts and crafts officers, which I thought was an interesting name. Um, but they had arts and crafts officers, and they decided to send uh, several of them into the Inuit communities and see if they could formalize the production of uh, stone sculpture and whalebone sculpture and other materials, and maybe there was money to be made from this. So we move from a trading kind of situation to the attempt to formalize this after the Second World War. And a man named James Houston uh, began going into communities and letting it be known that he was interested in buying art and the Hudson Bay Company, if you've had any contact with Canada, Hudson Bay Company is a very famous name. They had outposts all over the place. He would go to where those outposts were, word got out and people started bringing in things that they had or creating things because he wasn't uh, taking one of 50 initially um, for you know, the equivalent of 10 cents and 25 cents and a dollar and that kind of thing. He's buying up everything. And he brought it into uh, Montreal uh, in the early 1950s, began to bring this stuff, and they started displaying it, and people just gobbled this stuff up. They couldn't believe the quality of the workmanship, and they were so interested in what then were these representations of life on the land, a carved seal, a, um, a, a walrus, a whale, that kind of thing. So Houston encouraged uh, carvings, um, but he began to influence what was going on by saying, by the way, if I had 300 seals, I could probably sell those better than I can sell what's over here. So he began to influence, um, particularly what people were interested in, 
they were interested in things that to them represented the everyday life of the Inuit, okay? They weren't interested in anything uh, particularly avant-garde or anything terribly uh, creative in the sense they wanted the representations of what they saw as this interesting people that at that point nobody knew very much about um, that could be sold in galleries as art. So we're talking about the early 1950s. That's only how long ago this is. This isn't like a culture that's been doing art for centuries uh, for public consumption. Printmaking, the Inuit did do drawing on sealskin, but again, it was all for their own kind of use and purpose. And what happened here is that in the uh, Houston, uh, what he, he was an artist himself. Uh, he did uh, prints, um, some very interesting uh, kinds of work. I have a couple of his um, things that uh, are a little grotesque to me in terms of how they're drawn of human figures and the like. But he, in the late 1950s, began to encourage the Inuit to do drawings. And they would do drawings with felt markers and colored pencils and the like. And then they began to transfer those images onto a stone. Again, think potato block. And I'll show you in a minute. You put the paper on top. You, I'm sorry, you ink it. Put the paper on top. You roll across that, you pull off the print. And in 1958, that process produced the first Inuit prints. So 48, he's working in these communities. Cape Dorset is the major center. He encourages this to go on. He had studied himself at the Ontario College of art in Paris. He had no formal training, however, in printmaking. He was doing them one at a, drawings, kind of one at a time. So he goes to Japan in 1958. Houston goes to Japan because he wants to, he thinks those are the best printmakers in the world, and he goes there to learn not only the processes, but the papers they're using, and the techniques and that kind of thing. And he brings that back uh, to the communities. The result of that was, here was in 57, 57, I'm sorry, I was off by a year. This is one of the earliest prints that was done. This was done off a of stone. You can directly see, again, just keep thinking potato block. There's no kind of uh, fine work or detail work being done on the animals, the caribou themselves, um, but these are kind of blocked out uh, and printed on a sheet of paper. The earliest prints do either stone or linoleum floor tiles, which uh, print artists will still use uh, today. He was experimenting with stencils. He was using a seal skin to cut out the seal skin put it on a piece of paper and literally paint over that, which would leave the image. They were using x-ray film in the same way, cutting it out. Anything that would leave the image on the paper of all the carved out, or in the case of stone, all the remaining areas. Um, they were sold at the Hudson Bay Company in Winnipeg for the outrageous price of $5 to $12.50 a piece. Um, yeah. What are they worth today? Um, the, the early prints. Yeah. The early prints, uh, any, anywhere from uh, several thousand up to, there was a sale uh, only a few months ago of a print I'll show you in the 70,000 kind of range. Um, Kenojuak print, which is considered the greatest print ever done in the Inuit community. Um, they sold them at the Canadian Handicraft Guild in uh, Montreal. Here's another print. 
Interestingly enough, these are very two-dimensional, aren't they? In the Inuit world, you would think of, you have this vast space with long distances, but because of the ice and the white, I didn't believe this till I went up there. The world looks much more two-dimensional than it really is. And the early prints all were two-dimensional. And in fact, even some, some, some of the stuff being done today ha doesn't have as much depth to it as you would expect in, in uh, some paintings and prints that you've seen uh, produced in other ways. Um, so again, he brought back from Japan um, these, the techniques, the handmade paper, examples of prints. In 59, there was this flurry of activity and it finally led to shows being done uh, in the South, in Montreal and elsewhere. Um, so a collection of Inuit prints, there can be, Kate Dorset would, would produce uh, nowadays anywhere from 30 to 50 different prints and they produce up to 50 prints from a single stone or a single image. In the case of a stone, the stone is broken or um, because stones are getting harder and harder to get, they sand the stone down or, uh, and make it flat again and start over. Uh, my father at his gallery, I don't know how he got it. Um, I actually didn't want to know. He had one of those stones. And his la one of his last instructions to me was, I had to go break the stone. And I said, wouldn't it be better to just donate this to a gallery? And he said, I'm really not supposed to have this. Break the stone. So I got an artist friend of his. I couldn't do it. I got an artist friend of his to come over. We put it on the ground in the backyard with a sledgehammer. We broke the stone, which, which needed to happen because otherwise you could continue to produce the prints, okay? There is an important thing. On the prints, how they signed or made it clear it was a particular artist, remember, Houston had been in Japan, so they created a little chop figure for each artist. There was a chop for the community, which showed it was from Cape Dorset, and there would be the chop for the artist that would be in syllabics in Inuit lettering that would be the artist's name. Now, Inuit prints are interesting how they were originally produced. Somebody would do a drawing. A second person, that person wasn't necessarily skilled in how to transfer the drawing onto the stone. So there would be somebody who did the transfer supervised by the original artist, and then there was a printer. So although it, that, this print is a Pitsiolak print, she did the drawing. Somebody else transferred it and probably printed it. Okay? So that was very, it was very much a cooperative kind of process. Do the Inuit have a written language? They do, and it's in these syllabic, kinds of things, and when I get out my little chart, I can usually figure out the artist's uh, name, providing they've <laughs> followed their own rules of how to do it. So this is quickly the influence of the Japanese that Houston member brought examples back of, the influence of the Japanese on the Inuit print. On the right, that is a Japanese print. On the left, is an Inuit print. And you can see great similarities between the two. On the right is a Japanese print. On the left is the Inuit print. So they didn't just get told about it or the like. He brought back prints from Japan that influenced what they did. I didn't know any of that story. And when I first went in the 70s and looked at Inuit prints, I said to um, my wife, I said, those look very Japanese in terms of how they're done. And they're printed on rice paper. Ah, 
Okay. <coughs> Japanese in order. So definitely at Cape Dorset, um, Houston had brought this, not only the prints and the examples and the technology that enabled them to begin to produce this. This is a little bit more about the chop, that red um, semicircle kind of thing. If you see that on any print, it is a Cape Dorset print. That is the chop for their community. Holman Island in the middle and Baker Lake on the right. And the, uh, the chops are almost artistic works in, in of themselves. Okay, so here's the map again. Here's Baffin Island. Here's Cape Dorset. Um, Baker Lake, uh, see, Holman Island is over here. Baker Lake is here. Um, this is Greenland up here. Okay, it's a vast area. Uh, certainly, again, managing all this was made easier by people being in local communities. Okay, what's that line? Well, that's the trip that my wife and I took. We flew into Winnipeg, okay? We were supposed to go up to the Northwest, to what would be the Northwest Passage, north of Winnipeg, but unfortunately, this, this sounds strange, but the global warming made it impossible to get into the, into the Northwest Passage because there was so much ice there that had come off the uh, glaciers and the wind had been blowing and it blocked up some of the channels that we would have used to come back west, okay? Uh, come back east. So instead we went and landed, the plane landed in Resolute Bay and the ship that we were getting on, they couldn't come and meet us. They had a group of passengers. They were supposed to come all the way. They were supposed to come through all this mess, end up over here somewhere. Um, so we flew to them and I won't tell you about uh, the six hours we flew only to find it fogged in and then we had to fly back six hours refuel, fly back um, with stops and yell. Anyway, it was a long two days to finally get in there. And they told us we couldn't get in and for some miracle of moments, the fog lifted enough for us to just fly in. It was no problem for them taking off, but flying in, we had to have visual um, sight. So we went from uh, Resolute Bay, and then they decided we have some extra days because we should have been way over here. We had extra days on this ship. So they decided for the first time ever for this company, Lindblad National Geographic is the company. It's a small ship, 134 uh, passenger ice class uh, kind of vessel. Um, they decided to go up and we made it up to uh, 80 degrees north. Um, that is a long way north. Um, we went, kept going into little bays and channels uh, in here, and some of the most beautiful, I mean, the captain and the crew and the naturalists, the National Geographic photographer, these folks, they were as excited as we were. We were in places that there was no chart that a ship had ever been before and it, it was pretty exciting. What was also exciting was, of course, seeing the polar bears. Um, the one is nursing off, off of mom. The way uh, polar bears, uh, if they're on the land, that's not a good thing, okay? Uh, if they're on the land, you can't be on the land because they hunt people. Uh, from five miles away, eight miles away, ten miles away, they will know you are there. So before we could ever land any place, which was in those Zodiac kind of ships, before we could land, what they would do is they would send a crew out on the land, they would scout out the area, they had guns, um, the idea was to never use them, and if any sight, any sign of a polar bear was there, then we couldn't land. But where we could see them was on the ice floe. 
and they, that's where they hunt from. They hunt off the ice flow. Uh, and the reason we're so worried about the decimation of polar bear populations is because as the ice thins out and there's less of it, there's going to be less places for polar bears to be. Um, having seen them, uh, these absolutely magnificent creatures, um, it made me pretty committed to seeing what we can do to kind of save the population. I was mentioning before that um, uh, my wife and I really like cold and ice places. We've been to Antarctica, but we're going in the summer of 2020, leaving from Nome, Alaska, getting the same exact ship that we were on. We'll be going over to uh, Russia and then going north into the Chechen Sea to Wrangell Island, which has the largest concentration of polar bears in the world. And um, yeah, so we're looking forward to that. Of course, they offer you an opportunity on the ship to take what's called the polar plunge. And some of us don't, are not very smart. So um, this is me. Uh, my wife is on an upper balcony of the ship leaning over. She got my picture. The important thing to note here is the guy in the yellow jacket. If you're smart, why you might not want to jump if the ship's doctor thinks it's important to be out there watching you do this. Okay, and the question I always get is how long, what the, was the temperature? The temperature was 30.8 degrees. Uh, in the water, it below 32, but salt water freezes at a, a lower temperature. So it was, that was okay, there's no, nothing there. Um, I was in probably five seconds total. That was the time to uh, realize I was going to die now that I was in the water, uh, do uh, several really bad strokes up and reach, get the hand of this lady uh, who's standing there um, smartly. Look at how they're dressed. This is not warm, this is cold, okay? The air temperature wasn't much different than the water temperature. And the good news was, got out, you put a bathrobe on and they give you some schnapps. So um, when they asked me why I did it, I did it for the schnapps. <laughs> When we traveled with the same company to Antarctica two years ago, they offered the opportunity to take the plunge in the Southern Ocean. And of course, yours truly did it because thus I could claim to be bipolar. <laughs> okay, back to Prince. This gives you an idea of the stone, okay? The, the, Raised areas is what's going to print on the paper. And in terms of process, here is a stone, small stone that we actually saw at Cape Dorset. It's been inked. Here is the guy inking the stone. And then having put the paper, here it is, he's drawn the paper off and there's the print on the paper. And that's actually the Cape Dorset Art Center there. So, I'm very quickly, I'm going to take about five more minutes here. Women artists have dominated the printmaking business. Why? Uh, they've done it because it's something they could do at home. They often were doing the drawings on their beds. Uh, the men still early on were involved in the hunting kind of culture. Um, and it turned out a number of these women had incredible, incredible uh, talent. For women who lost their husbands, it was an economic form. It reduced their dependency on men. Um, and they were just good at it. This, this is the queen of all Inuit uh, artists. Uh, she, it, if you get to go by your first name, right? then it's a big deal. She's known as Kenoshawak. Uh, very rarely did Ashavak 
uh, mentioned. She just passed away a few years ago. She lived a long life. She had 11 children plus five adopted. Most of the ones she had herself died young, died very young. It's a culture in which, why would you have so many children? It's the same answer we got when we were in Africa. Why does an ostrich have 18 to 20 young? Because the survival rate is two. So you, if you want to reproduce and continue the species, you keep having children. You keep having young. Uh, she moved off the land in the 1950s. Uh, she spent three years in a sanatorium in the south uh, with tuberculosis. Um, she, she has every major designation you can have in Canada. What would be the equivalent of our Medal of Freedom is their Order of Canada. She's uh, considered the premier artist that Canada has produced. This is the $70,000 print on the left, and it's been made into a postage stamp uh, in Chanted Owl in 1960. My father in his gallery, he, uh, somebody came to his gallery and said, I want to sell you my print collection. And the guy showed him stuff. My father's going through it. And he, oh, yeah, 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 okay. And then he, of course, the guy had Enchanted Owl. So he bought the entire collection, 42, I think, prints, to get the Enchanted Owl. Um, he was very proud of the fact that he eventually sold it to a collector for $27,000. Um, I, one of the last things he asked me but, uh, before he died, do you know how much that print is worth? I said, I won't tell you because um, you're going to die anyway right now. <laughs> but this would kill you for sure. <laughs> so we won't talk about it. Uh, Pitsy Olak, who's the print here, um, she does absolutely wonderful inventive work. She was raised in the camps, another one, 17 children. And remember this for a minute because her daughter and then the da her granddaughter became artists and they're important in the story here. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here just so I can tell you an important uh, transitional kind of story. Helen Kalvack from Baker Lake. Pudlow, one of the most interesting guys. Pudlow ends up uh, going to an exhibition of his prints in New York. He comes back, he starts putting airplanes, and he starts in one of his prints, which they didn't allow him to do, he put a giraffe. And they said, there can't be a giraffe. And, they, and his answer was, then don't send me to New York. Okay, because what do we do? What do artists do? They do what they experience. They tell the stories of what they experience. This is my favorite Pudlow print, my youthful fantasy. Look at how out of proportion this person is to the muskox. But in Inuit culture, that's true. It's the muskox that has the supreme position here, a ship of loons. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip this four generation of artists, kind of, but I'm, what I'm going to tell you is that each generation has, in a sense, had a different life experience. And that is creating different art. The art evolves over time. And we can see that evolution. Come on. OK, we can see it. In, this is Pitsy Olak's work, OK? So she did what was on the land. What was in her mind was camp life. And she continued to do that pretty much throughout her life. The spirit world, those were the prints that she did. Young woman an hour. Her daughter began drawing in the late 1950s. And although she had grown up in the camps, her learning of art was in the workshops. And her main life experiences were in Cape Dorset. So she used acrylic paint, she used colored pencils, uh, she started doing much darker kinds of themes because she was in that transitional period of trying to figure out uh, what this living in a, in a community 
was all about. So her, her prints were very different than her mother's. This was her early print from 1970. But then alcohol is a, and alcohol abuse is a huge problem. By 1994, she's painting what is, or printing and painting what is her life experience. She had a daughter, Annie. Annie is, uh, and could have been, the dominant artist of our day. Um, the end story is that Annie was the generation that committed suicide. They, she moved to the South. She couldn't adjust to life in the big city. Um, she continued to do art. Everything she did was snapped up because it, it um, it was different and people knew she was telling the contemporary story, but she couldn't live in the world that she was observing and was part of. So she began drawing in 1997. She grew up in Cape Dorset. She moved after her mother died. She started doing these mortality and spirituality kinds of themes. Uh, her life was very tortured. She uh, lived on the streets of Ottawa and eventually committed suicide. But here's Annie doing a print of what? Dr. Phil on TV. In the 1950s, Alan Houston would have stopped her from doing this and said, people don't want to see this. They want to see polar bears and seals and the like. So this is the problem of transitional living. This is the problem. You're an Inuit, you're living in the north, you're surrounded by all this beauty, all this animal life which you didn't grow up in. It's not a subsistence existence anymore. Now you're living either in Cape Dorset, which is becoming more and more westernized by the day, um, Youth are incredible issues of, of education. A, what's the content of that education? Uh, I've seen, sorry, I've seen some of the textbooks that they used to use, and it was all about, you know, who discovered Canada as opposed to what was the history and culture of Inuit people, which is the, they need to know they're part of Canada, but they need to know the latter even more because that's the soul of an individual. And there are lessons of that in uh, what we do today in our schools and the variety and the diversity of people who live in the life. Employment is extremely high. Homes are small. Uh, they're just getting to building recreation centers and community centers. There's a brand new, fabulous, art center been built um, that is influencing not just printed art, but it is leading to song and dance and rap and uh, videography and all the different forms of communication that you would expect. So this is the final thing. Inuit and First Nations peoples generally find themselves in what could be called fourth world conditions. So they are living within first world and influenced by first world circumstance, but they don't have full control over their own lives and enough of the economic. Uh, there are mining companies that have wanted to come in to, uh, to the north and want to make deals with uh, the Nunavut to a government, and then they say, oh, but we don't want to hire any of your own people. We want to bring in all our own people, and until they can get an agreement that it will employ people from the indigenous community, uh, they, their view right now is we'd rather starve. Uh, you are not taking our resources and leaving us behind, because the resources is the only way out. They got home rule in 1999, but there's a very low degree of economic development activities. And as I said at the beginning, art is a tremendous part of the Inuit 
economy. And from my point of view, thank God it is. I think artists see the world and protect the world in a different kind of way. So um, thank you for sticking with me on this journey. It's taken a little longer perhaps than uh, uh, we should have, but long ago, i leave you with this quote long ago, our art was for ourselves. I think now Inuit art is becoming more of a commentary on contemporary life. It's going to change as our culture changes. We're not living in a vacuum anymore. I would add to that, we are not just going to produce what people want us to produce, the what sells, we're going to do what is within our culture and our living circumstance that makes sense to us. Thank you very much for your attention.